I just have to kill a few windows here, make sure I'm doing this all right. Thank you for patiently waiting. If you're impatiently waiting, no thanks to you. And I just gotta make sure I got the chat room where eyes can see it. And I need to shrink a window so that I can look like I'm looking into the camera when I'm actually looking to make sure I don't have any broccoli in my teeth. And then I click here and I say, hey, hey, I'm back. So, hey, folks, um, give me a thumbs up here in the, in the Google Plus page room. Leave me a comment if you can hear me, just so I can make sure. You know, I didn't check to see which microphone this thing thinks I'm using. Ooh, let me do this. Hey, I bet that sounds better now, huh? Oh, wait, let me try that now. I bet that sounds better. All right. And people are saying some sort of musical interlude. I assume that's me then. All right, and I will click on the Twitter. Oh, I already did. And I'm live. All right, wonderful. Okay. Welcome to another edition of QNBA, where you guys get to ask me questions about science, and I just make stuff up of whatever I feel like saying. Uh, in fact, I try to be as accurate as possible. Uh, it's not always uh, easy, because I get a lot of tough questions, but I do my best. And uh, this is something I try to do every Sunday. I've been remiss the past couple of Sundays because I've been traveling a lot, but I'm back. And this is a special edition because I'm doing this as part of DotCom 2012. Basically, uh, JoJo Crazy Cruise, Jonathan Colton Cruise, Jonathan Colton is the geek singer, uh, songwriter, with Will Wheaton and Paul and Storm and a handful of other folks uh, had a cruise where they did geeky things on a cruise. And so a bunch of folks got together and said, you know what, we're going to have an online convention, not at all to spite those geeks over there. We're just going to do it here on the internet. And uh, Chris Wright organized this and got Len Peralta and Josh Kagan and uh, Virginia and Bill Corbett, a bunch of other people, to do various things online just over the course of the weekend, just fun stuff. Um, uh, Mike Furman played last night. If you saw that, it was fantastic. It was really a lot of fun. The double clicks, uh, a lot of just a lot of fun stuff that's been going on. And I guess I'm doing the last thing here. I'm 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 playing cleanup, sweep, sweep, whatever the baseball term is. Uh, anchor is anchor first or last? I don't know. But anyway, uh, this is I guess the last official event of DotCon 2012, the online nerdly convention celebrating geek life. And uh, in honor of that, I'm going to be answering questions about the science of science fiction. So why not, right? Uh, one thing that uh, most geeks are geeky about is science fiction of some kind, uh, whether it's Battlestar Galactica, Star Trek, Star Wars, Starfighter, Star... Uh, the Last Starfighter, did I say that? Um, uh, I don't know. Um, uh, 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 Star-crossed? Oh, Star-lost. Does anybody remember the Star-lost? Oh my gosh. I was a little wee baby when that show was on. Terrible show about an arc in space. They get lost. and um, Star-crash, another one. Carolyn Monroe. Yeah, remember that one? No, none of you remembers that one. Um, that was a movie. But if you have a question about something that has to do with science and science fiction, hey, I'm here for you. But first, uh, just a couple of things. Um, my name is Phil Plate. I am an astronomer, a writer, an author, uh, bon vivant. Uh, and uh, I, I do this sort of thing. I write the Bad Astronomy blog on Discover Magazine's uh, blog. The Bad Astronomy, uh, the, they have a collection of blogs, and I write the Bad Astronomy blog for them. I've written a couple of books, uh, hosted a failed TV pilot, uh, actually several times, and that's me. Uh, and um, that's really it. So thanks. Good night, everybody. Oh, wait. No, I haven't taken any questions yet. So uh, you can follow me on Twitter. I'm Bad Astronomer, if you happen to be doing that. And uh, I've already got a question on Twitter from Leper. My hat's off to you, Leper. See, that's... Never mind. Who says, am I accepting questions via Twitter? No. Yes. Um, see, are there any questions on Twitter? Nothing I see yet. So I'll clear that out. 
and I will go to the. Whoop. I know this, and and you know this is live, so there's going to be, uh, you know, there are going to be mistakes. There are going to be me going. Uh, there are going to be long moments of silence where I'm looking something up or whatever. Sometimes it helps if uh, there's a picture or something I can find, and uh, I might look online for that, and screen share it with you. It's just me. So, you know, it, it, sometimes there'll be 30 seconds or so while I do that. So, scrolling down in the Google Plus page. Yeah, tonight's the Oscars, by the way. So I expect a lot of people are, are watching the Oscars, uh, especially people who are interested in science and science fiction, because there's so many science fiction movies that win the Oscars every year. Uh, let's see. So... I will ask that questions sort of deal with movies and TV shows. I'd like to stick with the theme, but um, if not, there are going to be other questions. I can see that here. Uh, here's a question from Desislava Haleva. Is that my, am I pronouncing that correctly? Oh, 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 before I get to the question, uh, if you're in the Google Plus chat and you are registered for Google Plus, right underneath uh, the video screen, let's see, right about right about here, there's a little plus one thing. Click that, and that lets me know how many people are in the room, kind of, sort of. It gives me an idea of how popular it is. And that, that doesn't really help, but it makes me feel better because uh, most writers have a terrible inferiority complex. Okay, so Desislav uh, Haleva's question is, it's a little old and not so sci-fi, but how about contact? How realistic is the science there? It's a little old, but not sci-fi. What? What? It's, it's fiction, and it's science, so... You could call it fictional science. You could call it speculative fiction. I would call contact science fiction. The best science fiction is the stuff that tackles big issues and philosophy, that has good characters, that has a wonderful story arc, that has character development. And uh, contact has all of that. It's astonishing that uh, Sagan wrote this as a novel. It was his first and only novel. And it was based on a lot of his older books, uh, you can you can see pieces of con if you if you if you watch the movie especially if you read the book Contact which is so much better than the movie um, you'll see pieces of his older books in there uh, Shadows of Forgotten Ancestors Broke His Brain uh, and some concepts he would then tackle in um, Demon Haunted World which I think came later Science is a Candle in the Dark the Demon Haunted World which is a fantastic book I can't recommend it enough um, so in the in the movie Contact it's 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 a little bit funny. You can look at it two ways. One is there's solid science that was based on stuff we do now, and then there's the really speculative science that takes place later on in the movie where you know basically aliens are contacting us, and they send us the design for a machine that we build. And spoiler alert, Jodie Foster goes through this thing. that It creates a wormhole, and she winds up talking to some aliens. Um, it's interesting. The, the science in the movie and in the book are pretty solid. You know, Sagan was a scientist. There are some tiny errors, and that happens. Um, uh, in the movie, at one point, Jodie Foster is talking about basically the Drake equation, this idea that uh, if there are so many galaxies in the universe and so many stars in each galaxy, and each star has so many planets, and each planet can have life on it, what are the odds of, of having another civilization out there? And uh, she says, you know, there are 100 million galaxies in the universe, and each one of those has 100 million stars, and each one of those, blah, blah, blah. And she throws in an extra factor of a million in there. <laughs> and it's just, a, it's just a flub. It's just a mistake. Uh, I'm, I'm willing to forgive that. It, you know, it's not like a critical error. Uh, there is a funny error that I didn't notice in the movie where the signal's coming from the star Vega. It's one of the brightest stars in the sky. It's also a star that's only about 25 light years away. Um, it's a similar star to Sirius, the brightest star in the sky, but it's farther away and fainter. And uh, Vega, the signal's coming from there, and so everybody's pointing their telescopes at it. And they're trying to get telescopes all around the world to observe it, because as the Earth is spinning, Vega's rising and setting. The thing is, Vega is close enough to the pole of the North Pole of the sky that if you're in uh, Sweden, for example, uh, it's circumpolar. It never sets. It's always up in the sky all, all day, all night long. And uh, there are radio telescopes up there. So, in fact, they could have observed, uh, they could have had one telescope on Vega 24 hours a day without having to, you know, call Russia or whatever like that. So, look, there are minor things like that. Pfft, who cares? For the speculative stuff, the idea of creating a wormhole, uh, an Einstein-Rosen bridge, as it's called, uh, 
who knows if that's real or not. But it, you know, it's it's based on our ideas of how the universe works and how black holes work. So uh, it's made up, but the idea that you can that you do this, it, it, the more important thing to me is that it's self consistent. If uh, if you know in Star Trek, warp drive is just as fast as to get you from point A to point B in the amount of time the plot needs it for maximum drama. That bugs me a little bit. You know, just go a little bit faster, get there a little bit sooner. Uh, in this case, it was it was all self consistent, and in fact, they use that in the end as a little trick to uh, play up on skepticism versus faith. And I won't spoil that if you haven't seen the movie. Basically, get it. Just go watch it. It's a fantastic movie. It's got great performances in it. I really liked it. I have some friends who poo poo it. Uh, screw them. It's a good flick. As a matter of fact, it's on my list of things I need to watch with my daughter. And we ha we have it on Netflix, and I've been meaning to watch it with her. She hasn't seen Close Encounters of the Third Kind either. Another movie I love. So uh, we'll be watching that soon. <laughs> Jamie Mueller asks, how about the science behind the old TV series Quark? Okay, first of all, folks, um, if you just ask me the science behind a TV show, broad topic, it's a broad topic. So if you have something a little more specific, that would be fine. Um, but it, 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 does anybody remember Quark with Richard Benjamin? And it was a, it was a satire in, ah, gosh, early 70s maybe, mid-70s, on Star Trek, basically. Quark was a captain of a garbage scowl, an, an intergalactic garbage scowl. He has to go and pick up trash. And his first officer, his science officer, is a plant whose name is Ficus Pendulata. <laughs> I think it was Ficus Pendulata. His name was Ficus something. And the, 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 the Wrigley Gum, the Double Mint Twins, uh, whatever their names were, uh, were navigators or something like that. You know, and it was just a, it was a ridiculous sort of uh, Mel Brooksian satire. Might have even been by Mel Brooks for all I know. Uh, and it was very silly. Uh, so the science of that's kind of silly. If you have garbage and you need to get rid of it, there's always a star you can dump it in. Uh, so I'm not, you know, I'm not too concerned about it when it's at satire level. Um, here we go. Matthew Kozacek asks, I'm currently reading Anathem. Anathem or Anthem? Is that a typo? I don't, I don't know what that is. And it has me wondering, why would you want to put a satellite into a non-geosynchronous polar orbit around the Earth? Ooh, this is a really good question. And it just so happens I will need one of my squishy models of science. Ooh. Oh, oh, oh! Standing up reminds me. In honor of today's theme, I'm wearing my Eureka shirt. Where is it? Eureka! Yay! Tesla is the, uh, is the high school, isn't it? So the math leads. There you go. Got that from the Sci-Fi channel. So a little shout out to my friends at Eureka. Um, so a satellite orbits the Earth, right? You, you launch it in a rocket, it has to go up, away from the Earth, and it has to go uh, horizontally, if you want to think of it, sideways, so that, it, so that the Earth's gravity is constantly bending the path of the rocket into a shape such that it orbits the Earth. If you just send a rocket straight out, it just goes away forever. But if you, if you send it at just the right angle and just the right speed, it'll orbit the Earth. And there are a lot of different kinds of orbits. Um, this isn't the best globe, but you can kind of see north... Boy, this is hard to do. There we go. Kind of see North and South America there. Um, there are equatorial orbits where it goes over the equator. And um, when you're in low Earth orbit, you orbit the Earth in about 90 minutes, something like that. The farther away you are, the slower the orbit is. The bigger the path, but the slower the speed of the satellite is. If you go out to a certain distance, which turns out to be about 40,000 kilometers, rough, very roughly 23,000 miles, it takes 24 hours to go around the Earth once. So if you think about it, the satellite's making a circle every 24 hours. But that's the same amount of time it takes the Earth to circle once. So the satellite is circling at the same speed that the Earth, well, the same rate that the Earth is spinning. So from the satellite's view, it's always looking at the same spot on the Earth. From the Earth's point of view, it's always seeing that satellite in the same part of the sky. So that's a, that's a pretty, cool, pretty cool orbit. You put a satellite there, like a communication satellite, and you can send signals up to it from a ground-based antenna, and that satellite's always up. It's never rising and setting. It's always in that spot in the sky right there. And that can be broadcasting signals all the time. Uh, weather satellites, communication satellites, uh, ca well, cable TV, that sort of thing. Uh, it's very convenient. Now, there's another kind of, uh, of orbit altogether. I'm listening for you. Come on. Come on, airplane fans. There's another kind of orbit uh, called a polar orbit. Instead of going around the Earth's equator, you send it on a north-south trajectory, and it goes around this way instead of this way. So if you think of the Earth's equator, <laughs> there we go, as being flat to the camera, an equatorial 
satellite would be doing this, but a polar satellite's going north-south, not east-west, but north-south. Now, the beauty of this kind of orbit is that as the satellite is doing this, the Earth is spinning. So the satellite is basically seeing the whole Earth over the course of a day. Well, more or less. It's a little bit more complicated than that. But you don't have to, the satellite is basically seeing the entire Earth because it, it's seeing the poles. From an equatorial position, you don't see the poles very well. From a polar satellite orbit, you do. You can look straight down the poles. In the meantime, the Earth is orbiting. So at first you're seeing, you know, you're going over North America, and then one orbit later, the Earth's rotated a little bit, and now you're over the Atlantic or you're over the Pacific, I guess. And as you go around over the course of a day or two, you basically see the whole Earth. This is great for mapping satellites or uh, satellites that are spy satellites because as the Earth is rotating under them, they, are, they basically can map out the entire thing. And so we have a lot of polar orbiting satellites. Uh, and, and that's why they're useful. If they, um, in a geosynchronous satellite, half the Earth is always hidden from you. In a low Earth orbit satellite, uh, you can only see a small section of the Earth because the poles are too far away to see. In a polar orbiting, uh, with a polar orbiting satellite, you can eventually map out the whole planet, and that's why they're that's why they're useful. So there you go. And I hope that answers your question, because sometimes I lose track of the question while I'm blathering on about stuff. Uh, okay, scrolling down. Why does Michael Bay insist on making such terrible science fiction movies? Because they make billions of dollars. So that was easy. Um, Alan Shand asks about the movie Solaris, um, a psycho-reactive planet. I actually don't know much about that. Uh, that. That was a book by Stanislaw Lem, and then it was made into a movie in the 50s, I think. It was a Soviet, Soviet Union movie, which is supposed to be 75 hours long and basically unwatchable. And then George Clooney remade it. I actually have not seen either version, nor have I read the book. I really need to do that. Um, uh, Lem is evidently a brilliant writer. I've read a couple of his things. Uh, and he, very interesting writer. I think it was Polish or Czech. I can't remember. Uh, but I think the, 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 the planet is sort of alive and reacts to the captain's thoughts. And uh, it's been re it's, this theme has been used several times. Uh, but I haven't seen it, so I really don't know about it. Um, that's fairly far out science fiction. I'm not really buying into that, you know, intelligent planets or anything like that. But it's a big universe. Who knows? Oh, Tree Lobster says Buck Henry, not Mel Brooks, for uh, Quark. Thanks, uh, thanks, Steve. That's funny because Buck Henry and Mel Brooks collaborated on a lot of stuff, including Get Smart, if you remember Get Smart. Oh, and Anathem is a Neil Stevenson book, so it's not a typo. All right. Um, okay, let's see. Courtly Canick asks, in Star Trek, one of the conceits of warp drive is that time passes for the crew so narrative can advance, but no significant time has passed either back on Earth or at the destination. Um, it's like they got in a car and took a trip and it doesn't take space-time dilation effects. Can you comment on that? Um, I don't think that's exactly right, Courtly. Um, I think in the show, uh, it, it, it's hinted. You know, they have to use uh, um, uh, star dates, which somehow takes into effect warp drive. But, you know, if, if you warp from planet A to planet B and it takes you an hour, I think an hour passes on those planets or maybe some other time. Uh, but it's not like no time at all happens, I don't think. Um, because uh, events take place. You know, they say, we have to get to the planet, you know, ep epilogue four before the epilogue and rescue the aliens that, that Q is torturing. Uh, and, and they get there and time has elapsed for the planet while they're on their way. Um, but in fact, you know, if, if, if you're traveling at relativistic speeds, if you're traveling near the speed of light, uh, time flows differently for you than it does for planets that are just out there. If you're traveling from planet A to planet B and you're traveling at 99.9999% speed of light, very little time passes for you, while a lot of time might pass for those two planets. Uh, and you have to account for that. Uh, that's a real thing. That is relativity. That works. That is 100% rock-solid science. We know that. If you're going to posit moving faster than the speed of light, things get a little funny. Um, and it's not just, you, you don't just go from point A to point B faster than light. It doesn't work that way. In a sense, it becomes time travel because time, this gets complicated and I've, 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 I've discussed this with different physicists and I get different answers. It makes me crazy. I'm not good at relativity. I'll be upfront about that. Um, it's the kind of thing where I can talk myself into almost any position. It's like, oh yeah, sure, it must be this. And then somebody says, no, 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 it's this. And I go, oh yeah, you're right, it must be that. <clears throat> makes me crazy. Um, 
you have to you basically have to do the math. But um, in some senses, faster than light travel is is traveling back. You're traveling through time. You're traveling backwards in time. There's no such thing as instantaneous travel. You can't go from here to Alpha Centauri like that in a split second, um, it, it, because there's there there are relativistic effects with um, what's called simultaneity of events. That gets super complicated. But uh, traveling near the speed of light, it's not just that your time slows down, it's that you might see events happening in a different order than someone else. And it's, it's very hard to accommodate that kind of stuff. Um, it, it may depend on how you're doing, how you're doing your faster than light travel, how, you know, if there's some conceit, if you're going to say you can travel faster than light, then maybe we're wrong about relativity. And, you know, of course, if faster than light travel is correct, if you can do it, then there must be some, not flaw, but some opening in relativity that we don't understand yet, some, some aspect of it that we just haven't discovered yet that allows for faster than light travel. And if that's true, who knows what can happen. Then you just make whatever you want up in your show as long as it's consistent. Um, when you look at the reboot of Battlestar Galactica, uh, they could travel faster than light, but only for short distances, and they didn't know exactly where they were going to be, and they had to do star chart references and, and, and take a fix on the star positions to figure out where they were. I love that because that was always consistent in the show. Um, and uh, in Stargate, it's instantaneous travel as long as you can go from one Stargate to the next. But then they introduced a little time travel element. If you happen to have a path that goes through a solar flare, you wind up going backwards in time. And they, they, they were fairly consistent about that. They used that a few times. Uh, and, and in fact, time travel is a fun topic because do you want to have a universe where you can go back in time and change things? Star Trek had it that way. You could use the Guardian of Forever, pop back into 1920s, uh, killed, uh, 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 what's her name, Collins, and uh, next thing you know, e Edith Keeler. I remember the character's name, but not the, not the actress's name. And, uh, you know, and the Nazis win World War II. Or do you subscribe to the universe being fixed in time? Time is just another dimension. It's all happened. This is more of a Vonnegut kind of a thing. So it doesn't matter if you time travel or not. It's all part of the universe. If you go back in time, you've always gone back in time. You can't change anything. You're part of that history already. So if you go back in time, everything that happens, happens. You can't change things. Um, I have some ideas about this. I won't go into it. But uh, I kind of like, like both. I like, I like, like the Terminator, where um, you can change things, but... Have you really changed things? You know, it's it's unclear if if things really changed or not. But then, in, as in the in the in the first movie, at least in the next movies, they made it clear: yes, it, things did change, uh, especially in the Sarah Connor Chronicles, which was a really good show. And I'm really sad that got canceled. Um, okay, let me check Twitter while the chat room refreshes, and I have to pull my glasses up so I can see things up close. Ooh. Leopard's asking about Ringworld. Have you read it? Could we build one with known materials? Ringworld, of course, have I read it? <laughs> um, I've read almost everything Larry Niven has written. Uh, I grew up, I mean, when I was reading science fiction in my formative years, when it was, you know, it was Asimov, Heinlein, Bradbury, uh, Niven, um, had, uh, Robert Sheckley, who destroyed my sense of satire and humor, made me who I am today. Between Sheckley and B. Cleveland's cartoons, you know, the cat, Mousy is what I love to eat. Uh, that basically honed my, my satirical sense of humor. Um, Ringworld, without going into details, is, uh, is a, about a gigantic structure. Instead of a... Instead of a you, basically, these aliens tore apart planets and constructed a ribbon that goes around a star. So it's basically a hoop, like a hula hoop. But instead of a hula hoop you put around your waist, it's a hula hoop that's... 300 million kilometers across, you know, 200 million miles, something like that. And it's a million miles broad. So I don't have, I don't have anything here I could really use as a hula hoop. I, got, I have these 3D glasses, which I can sort of make into a ring. So you can imagine a star in the middle right here where my nose is. And then this is a ring, 100 million miles in radius that spins around, and a million miles top to bottom. So it's just basically like a big, a big, uh, big hoop, and it's spinning to give gravity. So that if you're standing on the inside, uh, the sun is always straight up, and you feel a force outward. That's the centrifugal acceleration, uh, centrifugal force, centripetal acceleration, whatever you want to call it, down. And the thing has to be spinning really fast because it's so huge 
that to, to feel a force downward that's basically one gravity or close to it, this thing has to be spinning at, at about 1,000 kilometers per second, which is hugely fast. The two problems with it is that it's so much material. You know, it would roughly take the mass of Jupiter to make this thing, maybe more. It would take a million years to build one of these things. I mean, think about all of that material. You would have to deconstruct a planet and then reconstruct it into whatever this thing is. And even if you could, you could sit there and, and do this uh, at phenomenal speeds, you're talking about something that's a million miles wide and 600, uh, million miles? Yeah. and 600 million miles around. I'm sorry to mix units here, but that's a good one. So it's 6 trillion square miles. Is that right? Um, no, way more than that. It's 600 million, whatever. It's a lot. It's, it's millions and millions of times the Earth's area. How would you build something like that, right? It, it, would take, it would take the lifetime of the universe. And the other problem is you're spinning it so quickly, it would take a huge amount of energy to spin it up. It would just take forever to spin this thing up at those kind of speeds. And then you have a material which has to be incredibly strong because at that speed, steel would vaporize. It would not, it steel would, would pull apart. It wouldn't, just doesn't have that kind of strength to be able to do it. So what would you make this thing from? However, given all that, the ring world stories are fantastic. I love Niven's known universe stories. Um, in fact, he has partnered with, um, um, oh, somebody help me here. You know what? Basically, he's partnered with another writer to actually write more stories, and they're called the Fleet of Worlds series. Ed Lerner, I knew it was Ed, but I couldn't think of his last name. Perfect, Ed Lerner, uh, whom I met a couple of years ago at a, at a writer's workshop, actually. Really nice guy. Um, and these, these stories weave together. Niven wrote all these stories in the 60s and 70s, and, and later, but he started in the 60s and 70s. And the science changed since he wrote these stories. And you know, what we know about certain events has changed. Just the science has, has moved on. So in these new stories where we know more about what's going on, he's actually gone back and changed. He, he's kept all the original stories intact, but sort of threaded in between them to, to have them make sense. So that if something, if you say, why neutron stars don't behave that way, it's like, oh, because he just, because Niven just didn't know at the time. Now he's fixed it. He's gone back and retconned it so that it works. It's like this was a trick by a superior alien race. They set this up on purpose that way. It's like, oh, just reading it, knowing the stories as well as I do, because I've read them a million times, reading these, these fixes to the old story without actually changing them was magnificent. It's, so much, it's, like, a, it's like a mind game. You're, it's like a puzzle that you're trying to, trying to solve. So much fun. Highly recommended if you're an Evan fan. Um, and Ubik Dark is asking, where's my accent from? It's from, from right, right here. I live in uh, Boulder, Colorado, but I grew up near Washington, D.C. Uh, here's a good question from Curve Mudgeon. Oh, I like that, Curve Mudgeon. Um, what options besides rotation are there for artificial gravity on spacecraft? Ah, it's a great science fiction question, right? You've got a spaceship, and uh, you don't want all your characters floating around. What do you do? Really, there are only two ways to do this. One is you can spin it, and if you spin it, you feel that force outward. So, uh, again, you know, like on Ring World, it's spinning around, so people feel the force uh, downward. Uh, you could, I talked about this in the QNBA recently. I don't, I don't have a tube here. But if you have a um, drat, you know what I need? I need like a, a shelf just full of shapes. I need Euclidean solids, and I need my squishy balls, and I need little rocket ships, so I have little models, and I can do all this kind of stuff. Um, but if you have, oh, here's a, here's a spray bottle. If you take this and spin it, somebody, if, imagine now this is, you know, a couple of kilometers long and a few hundred meters thick, or even maybe a kilometer thick, if it's something really big. If you spin it, if you spin it like this, then somebody on the inside will feel a force outward. And so you can, you can make a giant tin can in space, basically, and spin it, and people will feel a force outwards, and that's gravity. That's one way. The other way is to have a spaceship so massive that it has its own gravity, like a moon, right? If you took the Earth's moon and equipped it with a star drive or, you know, had your nuclear piles blow up and a magnetic anomaly blasts out of Earth orbit on September 13th, 1999, say, um, it'll go flying through space, and you have gravity that way. The only other option is something made up, and that would be artificial gravity somehow, and we don't have any way of doing that. We don't know. Oh, oh, oh there's a third way, um, uh, acceleration. Gravity is 
a force. A force is defined as something that accelerates a mass. F equals ma. Force equals mass times acceleration. This is this was Einstein's big deal. If um, gravity is a force, it, it acts on your mass and accelerates you. Um, but you can't tell the difference between gravity and being in a spaceship and accelerating at such a velocity, accelerating at such a rate, excuse me, that it equals gravity. So if I were to drop something, oops, sorry about the thumping. If I drop my my spaceship here, it'll fall faster and faster as it falls. And it'll accelerate at a rate of 10 meters per second every second. A lot of people say it's 10 meters per second squared or 10 meters per second per second. What that is, it's, it's, it's how the velocity in meters per second is changing with time per second. So at first it's zero. You let go of it. After one second, it's falling at uh, 10 meters per second. After the second second, it's falling at 20 meters per second. After the third second, 30 meters per second, more or less. Um, and so it's accelerating. If you were in a in a in a car and you you hit you you know you hit the gas, and if you're accelerating at that same rate, you'll feel one gravity of force pushing you back. If you're in a spaceship, you can do the same thing. I was on a I, I flew for, with an F-16 uh, for Bad Universe, and we accelerated at one point at five gravities. I was accelerating at 50 meters per second uh, per second, and it, believe me, that was a lot. <laughs> so you can have another force that way. If your spaceship is always accelerating, you'll also feel a force. Everything else, you need artificial gravity or something crazy like that. And that's, that's at this point, science fiction. All right, let me go back to the Google Plus chat room. I will refresh that, as they say in Montana. I'll take the measure of people in Montana. I'm not making fun of your accent. I'm just imitating it. I'm making fun of it. Um, Uh, good news, The Forever War is going to be made. Yeah, I know. Um, Paul Holt's saying that. The Forever War is a novel by Joe Haldeman. This is another novel I grew up with. Um, it's a counterculture, catch-22 style uh, uh, science fiction novel sort of satir satirizing the Vietnam War. And it takes place in the distant future. Well, <laughs> it takes place in the near future when we go to war with this alien race. But due to relativistic effects, the war lasts for thousands and thousands of years. Uh, it's a fantastic book. It's very funny, very bleak and dark and funny. Um, Joe Haldeman's a really good guy, and um, it's been talked about being made into a movie forever, but now it's actually in motion, and I believe Ridley Scott is going to direct it, so awesome. Joan Collins, thank you, Steve DeGroot from Tree Lobsters. Um... Ah, Charles Wagner is asking about Dyson Spheres. This is good. Um... Many science fiction books and movies use artificial solid rings or Dyson spheres. I understand that gravity doesn't work that way. When you're inside a spherical shell, the shell's gravity doesn't affect you, correct? So it would, have, it would be hard to have a solid ring or sphere stay in orbit around a planet or a star. Um, this is true, okay? You have to be careful. With a ring spinning around the sun a, or a star, you feel a force outward. So somebody standing on the inside of the ring will, will feel a force away from the star. The star will always be straight up. The ring is going, it'll look like it's going this way. So you're going to see the ring going away from you, you know, sort of in each direction, in front of you and behind you. The problem with that is you're not really in orbit around the star. And so, in fact, if you, if you push on that ring, it's just going to slide away from the star. And, and Niven actually uses this idea in the second book, Ringworld Engineers. Uh, I won't spoil it. It's, just, it's a really good read. Um, it's worse for a Dyson sphere. Uh, Freeman Dyson, futurist, forward thinker, all that kind of stuff, um, he, he's a brilliant man uh, with whom I don't agree on everything. I'll leave it at that. Uh, but he came up with this really cool idea, and the idea is that uh, as a civilization advances, it needs more energy. Now, this is something we, we've seen up to now, at least. Uh, when you're living as a, as a tribe of nomads, you don't need a whole lot of energy. You need to keep warm at night so you can create a fire. Um, but you know, the energy you, you eat is basically enough energy to keep you alive. But nowadays, we use vast amounts of energy. We have to power our computers, we power our cars, our airplanes, our rockets. Um, everything takes a lot of energy. So we need a different source of energy, and that can come from burning coal. It can come from wind, solar, nuclear, uh, oil. The, uh, there are some other ideas. But if you want to start becoming a galactic civilization, if you want to go from star to star, you need a huge amount of energy, way more than we use right now. Uh, and even if you don't do that, just, just as, you, as your population grows, you need more energy, and, and, and sources are hard. His idea was the Earth 
is 150 million kilometers from the sun, and my sun model is not around, so I'll use my tennis ball, right? So let me make it so I can see what I'm doing here. If the sun is here and the earth is here, this is not to scale. Um, the sun is emitting light in every single direction, but only a tiny fraction of that actually intersects the earth. And it turns out the earth, the, the, the solid part of the earth facing the sun, is only absorbing one two billionth, if I remember this number correctly, of all the energy the sun is emitting. One two billionth. That's a tiny, tiny, tiny bit. So what if we built a giant solar collector with the same area as the Earth? We'd be receiving one billionth as much light. What if we made 10 of these? Then we'd start, you know, one 200 millionth. What if we made 200 million of them? What if we made two billion of them? What if we had two billion solar collectors, the area of the Earth, all around the sun in every direction? We would absorb every single photon the sun emit, emits. It's a huge amount of energy. You could power civilization for a long time. So this was the idea behind a Dyson sphere. Now, over time... This got changed into the idea of having a solid sphere, basically a, a thin spherical shell, like a balloon, with the sun at the center. And if you thought building a ring world was hard, this is vastly more material to do this. But if you do that, you can absorb all the light the sun gives off. And for a while, people were talking about looking for the signature of these things out in space. Um, basically, they would be warm because the inside of these things, you'd want to keep them at, uh, at basically room temperature, 25 Celsius, 70, 70 whatever Fahrenheit. And so what you were looking for is uh, a point source that's not giving off any light because it's blocking all the light, but it's glowing in the infrared at room temperature. Um, the problem is, first, there's no reason to build a solid sphere. As a matter of fact, it's ridiculous. The problem is, as, as uh, was pointed out in the question, there wouldn't be any gravity. The gravity of the shell, uh, Newton showed this 400 years ago. The gravity, if you're inside a spherical shell, there's no gravity pulling you out. Or, and there's no gravity inside. So no matter where you are, even standing on the surface, there's no gravity. I won't bother you with the math. You can look it up. It's a really basic calculus problem. Um, so how would you live on the inside of this? And then what are you going to do? I mean, there's no air. You'd have to fill the entire sphere with air. That won't work because there's a star in the middle, right, that's hot. So it, 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 dumping all that waste heat, it just doesn't make any sense. So the idea of building a Dyson sphere to live on is, is ridiculous. Um, by the time you would have the technology to build something like that, and you would need that much energy, you could build starships that could just take you to another planet. Um, and I have a feeling that's a lot easier than building one of these things. So I'm skipping over some logic here, some things I've thought about this, um, but I actually feel that we will ne that nobody that there's no civilization that's ever built a solid Dyson sphere. It's, it's silly. You may be building giant solar collectors. I think that that's feasible. It's hard, but who knows what our technology will be 10,000 years from now. I think, but I think you can do it. Um, that, but that's very different than what people think of when they think of a Dyson sphere. Um, uh, P. Stemish, name's familiar. Do I know you? Name's familiar. Uh, asks, how would, uh, how would you propose they reimagine the cause of the moon being blown out of Earth orbit in the new Space 2099 series? Okay. Space 1999 was a TV show in the mid-1970s. It, it was two seasons long. It was Jerry and Sylvia Anderson who did the Thunderbirds and the, the Super Marionation uh, shows. Uh, and uh, they did UFO. I loved that show when I was a kid. Uh, and Space 1999 was a huge, huge impact on my life. I mean, it was a tremendous show for me. I was 13, I think, when it came to America. Martin Landau, Barbara Bain... Uh, a wonderful show. Had a magnificent, huge crush on Catherine Schell. Uh, high point in my life when I met her at a convention. She was terrific. Um, I've written about I've written about the show on my on my website. Basically, the premise is there's a, a nuclear pile on the moon, nuclear reactor that explodes, and there's weird magnetic things that go on that launches the moon out of Earth orbit and into space. Now, there's a million reasons this won't work. Uh, it would take way more energy than you could ever generate to push the Earth out of moon orbit, uh, to push the moon out of Earth orbit. That amount of energy dumped into the moon, I need to do the math. I haven't done that yet. Uh, I'm going to be writing about this soon, so in fact I will be doing the math soon. I suspect that much energy would vaporize the moon, um, and that, so that wouldn't work. Uh, plus, you know, in the show, in the first episode where they break out of Earth orbit, they're, they're all slammed down to the floor, um, and they're, it, it, it's kind of funny. They're on, they're on a moon base that's on the... Oh, you know what? I've got a moon, I've got a moon squishy ball, too. 
Ah! Cosmic catastrophe there. Everything fell off my shelf. Here's the moon. Here's the Earth. They're on a base that's on the near side of the moon. So for them to have a force this way, right, they're being pushed down onto the floor of the moon base, the moon would have to accelerate this way. So, you know, it would actually get closer to the Earth. It might even hit the Earth. I, it depends on the vectors. It depends on how all that adds up. It would actually pass near the Earth first, but they just show it moving away. If it's moving away, they would, they would all be thrown to the ceiling of the moon base. But they show them being accelerated at high gravity, high acceleration, 4 or 5 Gs, for a couple of minutes. Um, and it turns out that's, that's fast. I mean, they would be moving relatively quickly, but uh, not nearly fast enough to even break out of the sun's gravity. That might get them out of the Earth's gravity. I, again, I have to do the math, but not the sun's for sure. And certainly not enough for them to get to a nearby star in anything under you know, a million years. Pardon me? So it's silly. But um, they started talking about space warps in the show and time warps, and they go through wrinkles in space and stuff. So you can kind of go, uh, maybe. And then um, one of the things about that show is there's a sort of an, a, a story arc that they, they don't plug into as much as they could have when they, when they did the show. And when the show came out, it was, it, this was actually a, a way that the reason critics hated the show. There was always this mysterious unknown force that came down. And, you know, and, and these aliens or whatever were really far advanced of, of our poor humans stuck on the moon base. And, you know, some weird thing would happen. It would take over people's minds or whatever, and it was never explained. In point of fact, I think that's really what would happen. If there's a lot of life out there in space, the chances are it's either way behind us, evolutionarily speaking. I hate to use that phrase, behind us. But, you know, if you think in terms of our past, I, I suspect that if we start finding life on other planets most of these planets are going to be covered in algae. Our planet, life evolved after not even a billion years, and for three, bil for three billion more years was just, you know, multicellular life at best. So for most of the lifetime of the Earth up to now, life on Earth was primitive. I hate to use that word, but it, it's good enough for now. Um, so chances are, if we look at planets all over the galaxy that are the same age as the Earth, or roughly that. Three quarters of them will be covered in you know, yeast, algae, whatever. But if a planet only has a few million years advance on us, they'll be a million years more evolved. And again, more evolved than whatever. So who knows what they'll be like? What do humans be like in a million years? So I kind of like that idea. Plus, there were multiple times when all of the stories kind of fit together. They never actually say, gosh, it's just like Ara, that, that woman on the abandoned spaceship told us that this would happen. They never really do that. But there's a series of weird things that happen to the moon where you can see it's tied together. And at one point, they explicitly talk about God. And it was, it was, I thought it was actually handled fairly well for a science fiction show in the 70s. I would, uh, uh, um, the good news is uh, Jace Hall is, uh, uh, with HD Films has, uh, is going to be rebooting the series with um, ITV, who originally did it back in the 70s. So they're going to redo the show, Space 2099. And I'm really thrilled. I, I, I love this show. Um, there are no spaceships and alien shows on right now. Um, there are a couple of alien shows, but they're, you know, eh. I'm not a big Falling Skies fan. I like Stargate Universe, but it's gone. Dang it. So I'm actually looking forward to this. I think, you know, if, if they keep the Eagle spaceship the way it was in the 1970s show, I will be so happy. Um, let's see, it's quarter of seven, so I've got about 20 minutes left. Um, all right, so Twitter is not asking me questions right now about this. Oh, <laughs> I've got my window open. I was hoping I could pull my webcam out and show you the view of my window. I can see Venus out my window just looking right now. I was out earlier today. And I could see Venus and Jupiter during the day, broad daylight. I had my binoculars. That was so cool. I was hoping to find Mercury tonight, but I could not see it. And it was probably up while I, when I was getting this started up, but I can't, uh, I can't, uh, I couldn't go out and, and, and look because I was too busy setting this up. Um, tree lobsters. A more fun premise for Space 1999 would be a botched wormhole experiment. Um, that was actually the premise of a uh, reboot I happened to see on YouTube the other day. I was looking this up. If you look up Space 2099 on YouTube, one thing that comes up is this long presentation on how they could reboot the show. And they talk about that. And I think that's actually not a bad idea. 100 years from now, they're going to 
you know, they're going to create an artificial wormhole. They do it on the moon because that's far enough away from the Earth that maybe it's safe. And whoop, moon gets sucked into it and away it goes. Kind of like that idea. Quick, easy, and it gives you an out. You know, if, if uh, maybe it's an unstable system and it creates wormholes and they just keep falling through it. Um, oh, Josh Andrew, Andrews asks a good question. Here's a solid science question. What do you think of the chances of finding something to mine on the moon, such as in the film Moon? The film Moon came out, what, a couple of years ago? Uh, with um, Sam, uh, what's his name? <laughs> and see, I don't know. I have all the all the information at my fingertips, and I don't want to take the time to type it. But the premise, I won't I won't go into the plot of the movie. It's a it's an interesting flick. I had a lot of friends who really 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 loved it, and I thought I don't really really love it. It's a good movie. I really enjoyed it. It was different than than most movies coming out now. Uh, I thought it was directed quite well, um, but it was based on the premise that uh, there's a, a a base on the moon. It's basically a mining base with one guy on it. And there are these giant robot tractors that are basically sifting through the moon's rock and extracting the helium-3. And helium-3 is an isotope of helium that supposedly is, is easier to fuse. Um, fusion technology is something that it's, it, the sun uses fusion to create energy. And, and basically, without going into the science of it, you take uh, atom, different atoms and you squeeze them together, the nuclei fuse, and you release energy. Um, the amount of energy you get out of this is huge, way more even than atomic fission, which is what uh, uh, atomic reactors use now, the fission nuclear plants. Fusion generates a lot more energy, and if you do it correctly, if you can do it right, you don't necessarily have radioactive material left over. But helium-3 is kind of a, is one of the keys to that. Helium-3 is uh, in the solar wind. It's, that's where the, the, most, the biggest source of it is, as far as I know. And that's constantly, it's been pummeling the moon for four billion years. So that helium-3 is, is sort of mixed into the lunar uh, rock and the dust on the surface. It's not really soil. Soil is rock that's been broken down by bacteria. So it's not called soil. It's called regolith. That's what the, the dusty surface of an airless world is, regolith. So they're sifting through this to find helium-3. They're mining it and sending it back to Earth for fusion power. Um, um, yes, that should work. We're pretty sure there's a lot of helium-3 in the, in, the, in the regolith of the moon. We can guess how much is there. Is it worth mining out? I don't know. In the future. Right now, is it worth mining out? No. We have no way of fusing this stuff. We don't have work, working nuclear fusion technology. Um, we have enough helium-3 here on Earth to at least start figuring out how to do that. But helium technology is kind of like artificial intelligence or everything else. It's always like 20 years. Just 20 more years and we'll have it. Um, fusion is really, really hard to do. And uh, fission is so much easier because um, it, it's a natural thing that happens in a lot of radioactive uh, isotopes like uranium and, and those sorts of, sorts of things. They, 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 they fission naturally. And you can accelerate that process uh, arbitrarily. You can make it 10 times faster, a million times faster, whatever. You can make it so fast you get an explosion. But if you do it just right, you can make it happen quickly enough that you can extract that energy out of it. Um, so that's great. But with fusion, it happens so fast that uh, it's, it's hard to control it. And that's one of the biggest problems is keeping your, your fusion reactor from exploding. Um, it's also hard to get more energy out of it than you put in. You can do that. There's energy stored in the nuclei of atoms. It, it's extracted when you fuse them. Um, but it takes a huge amount of energy to fuse them, and the amount you get out is, so far, not really enough to make it worth it. So it's, it's a great idea for a science fiction story. It's, in, it's, it's not like faster than light travel. It may, may be possible. It's more of an engineering issue than a physics issue, right? It's faster than light travel is a physics issue. We just don't know how to do that. We don't even know if it's possible. Whereas fusion is at least physically possible. The question is, can you do it? Can you build something to do it? Um... Oh, here's an interesting question. Albert Shaw asks, what would happen if the moon started to rotate? Would this affect anything on Earth? Not really. Um, the moon does rotate. I can answer this one quickly. Um, if the moon didn't rotate, imagine, here, let me make it so you can see the label. See the label there? That little white splotch? Here's the Earth. If the moon didn't rotate, and I keep that label pointed towards you, you could see that on Earth, they would, on Earth right now, somebody on my side of the Earth can see that label but now they, they wouldn't be able to. It would be on the wrong side of the moon. Um, basically, over the course of one lunar orbit, about a month, we would see the entire moon. 
but we don't. I have to make the moon rotate. I have to turn my hand around to keep that label always pointing towards the Earth as I move the moon model around. The moon is rotating once per orbit, once per month. So it already is rotating. But if you were to somehow spin that up faster, there wouldn't be any effect on Earth. You would, you would basically just see the whole moon spinning. Um, over huge periods of time, thousands or millions of years, there are some subtle tidal effects uh, that would change the moon's orbit because the, the moon and the Earth, inter they, they, they swap energy by tidal forces. That's very complicated. If you go, if you go online, and hey, you are online because you're watching this, and you search for bad astronomy, tides, moon, and Earth, for example. I've written an essay about that. It explains why the moon spins once every time it goes around the Earth, why the moon is receding from the Earth. The moon moves about this far away from the Earth every year, about four centimeters, roughly the same pace that your fingernails grow. How about that? And it has to do with the way they exchange energy through tides. Um, and that would be affected if the moon rotated more or less. So there you go. Um... Yeah. Gregory, oh, um, oh, which podcast? I'm blanking on the name. I'm, I'm sorry, Greg. Um, I was on his podcast last year. Uh, says, I was wondering what your favorite non-real sci-fi plot device is. Mine is Red Matter in the Star Trek movie. Um, yeah, I'm not a big fan of Red Matter. I thought it was silly. Um, it didn't send me into a rage, but I thought it was pretty silly and inconsistently used, and that bugs me when something's not used consistently in a plot. Um, Basically, faster than light travel. I, I, it, it, the nearest star to the Earth that we know of, Proxima Centauri, is about four light years away. So at the speed of light, it's four years away. And how are you going to get there in any kind of time? You have to go faster than light. The only other way around that is to make ships that go really, really fast, um, but you just don't worry about the amount of time it takes to go there. So it's part of your plot. That, that's not Star Trek, right? You can't have your characters going from planet to planet all the time. But if you make that part of your plot, I mean, like, to go back to Larry Niven and his known, known space stories, um, for hundreds of years, humanity only had fusion drive. Uh, and so uh, you can only go so fast. You can only go very close to the speed of light with that. So colony ships were these gigantic ships that would uh, put people into, into hibernation, send them to these other planets, and they would colonize it. But it would take you know, 40 or 50 or 60 or 100 years to get there. And he wove that into the plot. Basically, these planets are cut off from the Earth. Uh, the Earth would send probes every few years. But if you, you know, your news was always several years old, you would communicate with the Earth using lasers, basically. Um, but your news was old. And if you, if you said, hey, we need help, it would take 10 years to get there. And then they would send a message back 10 years later. It, they would say, help's on its way. And then 100 years later, there'd be a ship. Right? You have to weave that into your story. And, and Niven did that. But it's not Star Trek, and, and you know, what are you going to do? Um, okay, let me refresh the chat room, and I'll go back to Twitter to see what people are saying. Hi, Nicole. Noisy astronomers in the house. I know. I'm so, I'm so white, I really can't say that. Um, oh, um... Chris, uh, Chris Wright, who is running .con, oh my gosh, Chris, thank you for tweeting us, says, if you get this before the end of your show, we still have a Think Geek gift certificate you can give out during your show. Oh, and I've read that out loud. I don't know how to give it out. Um, golly, when Ginny and Bill Corbett gave, were doing their ice cream, they just gave it to the recipe that won the, best, won the most votes. Um, how about... Uh, you know, I, I don't know how to give away a gift certificate here. I mean, I've got a lot of questions. Um, I can ask people to vote on their favorite question, but I don't see a way to do that. Um, if anybody has any ideas on how, how I could give away a ThinkGeek gift certificate, um, I could think of a number between 1 to 100, give you all one minute, and the person who comes closest <laughs> gets the gift certificate. Um, but um, there's still a few minutes left, so if anybody has any ideas, post them in the chat room, and we'll try to figure this out. Um, am I familiar oh Courtly again am I familiar with the 70's film Earth 2 with Gary was that Gary Lockwood Earth 2 wasn't Gary Lockwood was it it was um, it was um, John Saxon was it Gary Lockwood John Saxon made another one these were Gene Roddenberry made a bunch of movies after Star Trek and was trying to find a good pilot for another show 
Uh, if you've ever seen the Quester tapes, holy cow, this was a movie done in the, in the 70s about a, a, a self-aware android. This is a really cool flick, very advanced thinking for its time. You know, Roddenberry was always decades ahead of where everybody else was. And it wasn't made into a movie. And Earth 2 was another one. Um, and anyway, she's asking about it, uh, saying, creating a politically autonomous space station populated with an international scientific community, heaven or hell. Um, I'm thinking of a different movie with John Saxon. Um, I can't remember what it was, but he's in suspended animation and wakes up. And uh, there's basically a really advanced civilization on Earth and a really primitive one. Um, and in the primitive one, primitive, right? I mean, they don't have a lot of technology. Women ruled over men. It's a very, again, a very Roddenberry kind of thing. Um, golly, 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 and I can't remember much of it. I'll have to find these. It's tough to find these movies uh, online. Um, I wish somebody would take these and digitize them. However, they would do that. Put them on. Put them on. Man. Um, but a space station populated with an international scientific community, heaven or hell. It's a funny idea. I remember when I was a kid reading um, a Superman comic book where they find a planet where scientists were in charge. And I thought when I was a kid, that would be great, ruling by reason and logic. And it's like, what baloney? I mean, realistically, when I grew up, it's like, are you kidding me? Scientists running the planet? It would be a disaster. Um, not that I'm happy with the politicians we have now, necessarily. Um, but sci I mean, clearly, scientists are not good at politics, typically. We do have some scientist politicians. There are a couple in Congress. Um, but in, in general, you know, scientists make terrible managers. Uh, and so just in general, I'm not saying that, you know, in any specific case or anything like that. I've had really great managers and who, who are scientists, just like anybody else. You know, it just depends on the person. But just in general, uh, that would be my, my vision of hell. <laughs> um, uh, it's it, nothing... When it comes to some decisions, it's not always scientific. Uh, clearly, we're having issues in the United States right now because of issues that, that should be scientific, global warming, evolution, whatever, uh, stem cell research, even things like abortion and sex education, which you can reduce scientifically. If you, if you, want, if you want to take a sort of a scientific viewpoint on it, you can reduce these things to where you can get rid of a lot of the arguments. But in the end, you know, it's, it's, there's still some, some aspects of it where the scientific method doesn't work as well as it could. Uh, and it certainly doesn't work when you have, you know, five different religions fighting over, over sort of the basics of what they're, they're, the points they're trying to make. So, uh, and, and, and none of them is based on science. So it, it's very, very difficult. And scientists running things uh, would be an epic disaster. Um, Mike Ayler asks, is there one science fiction book you think everybody should read? And what is it? A science fiction book? Yeah, Contact. I think Contact would be it. Um, a lot of the books I read are parts of a series. I mean, I love Old Man's War by John Scalzi. I haven't been reading a lot of science fiction lately, um, but, but Scalzi's books are great and all this. And I, you know, but all these books are typically part of a bigger universe. Contact is self-contained. It has everything. It has religion versus science. It has faith, faith and belief versus evidence. It's got... Um, Aliens and, and some basic good science in it. It's got some, some well-done characters. And it, I think it's the kind of thing that anybody can read. It doesn't matter if you are a big uh, sci-fi nerd like I am and you like rockets and aliens, or if you're somebody who likes to ponder big questions. Because that's, I mean, the last page of that book, just even thinking about it now, little hairs, there are hairs on the back of my neck. They are standing up. I love the end of that book. I have so many friends going, oh, that was ridiculous, blah, blah, blah. It's like, it's kind of the point. The, the, he, he invokes some extremely big stuff at the end of that book. Uh, and I think, every, I think everybody sh could read it and everybody should read it. Um, Lila May, no, you do not get the certificate. Ha, 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 you make fun of me too much, so you don't get it. Um, that's my friend Melissa on Twitter. And shockingly, she's being a pain because that's all she can do. Sad, really. Uh, let's see what we got here. People are saying a cannibalism contest. Nah, it's too hard to swallow. Oh, it's Logan. Hey, Logan. I used to work with Logan. Um, the plus one's on a question. Uh, that's not a bad idea. But can I sort the questions by the plus ones on them? 
I don't know. I don't let's see comment share. I'm just I'm sorry. While I'm doing this, let me just look. See, there's there's in, in the in the Google Plus uh, page where this hangout is taking place. If somebody leaves a comment, you can actually plus one it. You can you can do that. But I don't see a way of doing that. Uh, I mean, you guys could vote that way, but I don't see a way of me being able to tell which ones get the uh, which ones we get the plus one. How um, difficult? Uh, I'm just looking to see if anybody said anything else. Um, random number generator for every comment to pick a number between one to 102. But the comments aren't numbered, are they? I don't see the comments being numbered. Oh, this is unless somebody sees that. If somebody here knows more about it than I do, um, keep. I mean, keep going. I can still go for another ten or fifteen minutes here if you all don't mind. Um, I just. I'm not really sure how to do this. Oh, Tree Lobster says John Saxon was in Planet Earth. That's right. And Earth Two was a different movie. That's right. Um, I don't remember Earth Two that well, but I do remember Planet Earth. I watched it. It really affected me when I was a kid. I could do a text search for plus three. I see some comments that have plus one. There's one for plus three. Let me see if I can search on that. Plus three. Oh, yes, that does, in fact, work. Very good. Okay. Um, who suggested that? Holy crap. Um, Rafael Miranda. Rafael Miranda. Ooh, that's a great name. Um, I love the names of folks in, in the chat rooms. They're always... You know, I don't think I've ever seen a John Smith. There's always something wonderful. I mean, Desislava Haleva. That's terrific. My gosh. Um, so, yeah, why don't you guys do that? Um, in the chat room, and if you're, if you're listening to this and you're, you're tweeting on Twitter, um, go, into the, go into the room. Let me put the um, uh, Q-N-B-A-ers. Go here and vote on your favorite question I answered. So I'll do that on Twitter. So I'm giving you the link of the room. Go here. Um, and uh, the worst typist using plus one. So go here and vote using plus one on your favorite question I answered. There we go. Send that. You know, I'm going to click that and make sure it works. <laughs> Uh, yes, excellent. Um, so folks, go back. So if you're in the room, uh, go back over all the questions. God, there are a lot of them. There's over 100 of them now. And start plus one the ones you've liked best. Um, you know what? You, you can plus one ones I didn't answer. And I'll let this run until 12 after the hour. It's 7.07 .07 Boulder time right now. I'll let this run for five more minutes. Then I will start searching on plus, like plus five, plus six, plus seven, until I get to the one that has the most. Please stop at at, at twelve after the hour so that you know I, I I have a fair chance of doing this. I'll see which one's best. If I've answered it, they win the certificate. If I haven't, they still win the certificate, and I'll answer their question. Um, if it's something like, "Am I wearing pants?" No, not gonna not gonna answer that. But I'm not. You know, I'll do a Craig Ferguson. No. <laughs> there you go. Um, wow, that was cool. Tom Garland asked, are the ending for the book and the movie Contact different? Well, you'll just have to read and watch them, won't you? Um, the endings are very similar up to a point. The book takes it another step farther. Um, and uh, it literally, I mean, in, in the movie, the way it ends, they leave this big question open over whether her trip was real or not. And the book does that as well. Um, and and uh, in the last the last page of the book. Um, you, you just have to read it. Just have to read it. Such a cool idea. Um, they are available on DVD. Oh, like Genesis 2 and Planet Earth, all those? Oh, cool. Earth 2 was not one of the Roddenberry-based stories. Right, Genesis 2, Planet Earth. Strange New World. Strange New World. Really? I don't even know that one. <coughs> Strange, okay, let me, I'm going to write that down. Um... Strange New World. Um, and, and, of course, the Quester tapes, which was fantastic. 
uh, if you can get past sort of the 70s stuff that goes in it. And it stars uh, Mike Farrell, BJ Honeycutt from uh, MASH. Okay, so I'll do a little refresh here again. Uh, yes, Melissa, you have mentioned how devastatingly handsome I am, but you did it 20 years too late, babe. Sorry. And you, is, your, is your boyfriend listening to this too? Hello? For those of you wondering, Melissa and I are old friends. And by old friends, I mean I'm old and she's young. <laughs> uh, but we've known each other a while now. Uh, who is River Song? Ah, if you don't know, I'm not going to answer it. But you should watch season six of Doctor Who. River Song is uh, Alex Kingston. And my wife and I have an agreement that I can run away with her forever if I ever meet her. I love Alex Kingston. She is awesome. Oh, yeah, the timestamp on the comments. Good good point, uh, Corey. Thank you. I just won't look at any comments that have a timestamp. Oh, that won't work, actually. Because the plus ones, the timestamp on the comment could be earlier, but the plus ones could come later. All right, never mind. Uh, Andre Tagasele? Tagasel? Tagasel? Taggart? John Smith asks, two Star Trek-related questions. Will there be a holodeck like ever? And could a Voyager probe someday come back from the far future like Star Trek, the movie, the motion sickness? Um... A holodeck, not, I don't think it's possible the way they talk about it in the TV show in, in Next Generation, but the idea of creating a 3D virtual environment that you can interact with, certainly. We know we can do that. Um, assuming replicator and transporter technology, yes, you could create solid things, um, but they kind of changed that technology around to fit the plot, and so it was self-contradictory a lot. Um, and they would use gravitational gradients and things to to change, you know, you could, so you could feel like you were walking uphill and that sort of thing. Um, but actually creating something like that on the fly, the energy requirements are huge. It's the problem with transporter technology. If you convert somebody to energy, that's like a gazillion atomic bombs. And how do you store that much energy? Um, so, yeah. And the Voyager probe, I mean, the, the Voyager, the Star Trek one was that the Voyager probe went out into space and this planet picked it up. Um, it was Voyager 6. Uh, the only way it could get to another planet would be if it were traveling faster than light. So um, it, it, our probes now would take tens of thousands of years to get to the nearest star. The only way they could be picked up would be if some ship happens to pass by and see it. And at that point, they'd be so close to the Earth, they would be hearing our. our they would. They could be able to tell that the Earth was a technological civilization. So I'm not really buying that part of the movie. But there's a whole Borg tie-in too, which was kind of cool. Um, Al Wirt's question about, ooh, sunshine, I missed it. It's hard to, it's actually hard to see all the questions. Um, ah, here we go. Al Wirt asks, and I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly, have you seen Danny Boyle's film Sunshine? How realistic is it that Brian, Ch Brian Cox could jumpstart the sun? Uh, uh, Danny Boyle's did 28 Days Later, I think. Did he do the second one? He did the first one. Um, and and uh, the movie Sunshine was an interesting movie. Uh, basically, the sun stops generating energy, and so we have to build a giant starship that's going to be or a spaceship that goes to the sun and drops basically this gigantic bomb, which is miles long, evidently, into the sun to restart it. Um, I don't want to spoil the movie. It's uh, I, it depends on what you're looking for in this movie. I, it disappointed me in one sense because the whole end of the movie is very different than the beginning. At first, it was a very philosophical interesting, thoughtful movie, and then it turns into a very different movie at the end. Um, and I have friends who love that. It, 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 it disturbed me. I mean, I wasn't expecting that. And it was such a change in, in flavor of the movie that I didn't, I didn't like it. Um, I probably should watch it again. I've got it on, on Blu-ray or something. Um, I should watch it again. Brian Cox is a physicist in England. He's an old friend of mine. He was the science advisor for that movie. They brought him in after the plot had already been written, and they said, can we do this? Can, is there some way to kickstart the sun with a bomb? And he came up with some, you know, mumbly jumbly stuff, some jiggery pokery that would that would turn the sun back on. And uh, you know, I don't I don't know if it would work or not. He assures me. I asked him about. It, he said, Yeah, this would work. This would do it. But they don't really explain why the sun turned out or turned off. And even if the sun, even if fusion stopped happening in the sun's core, it would be thousands of years before we would see a temperature change. Not a million. It turns out it's that's complicated. I won't go into it. But you know, after some thousands of years, the sun would start to uh, would start to shrink and cool off. Actually, um, uh, but you know, that's just one of those that's one of those gimmies. That's a that's a, what they call a MacGuffin. It's a plot device. You just use it. There were other things in the movie I really liked. Um, uh, the the scene where they pass Mercury, or they're 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 heading into the sun, 
and they see Mercury transit the face of the sun. So literally, let me get a, a minty of science here. Um, imagine if you're, you're on the bridge of the ship and here's the sun. They see Mercury literally passing in front of the sun. And they watch this from the, from, the, from the ship. They're actually sitting in the front and they're watching this. That scene, as I recall, really got to me. It's very emotional. They're all very quiet. They're all dealing with their own issues that they're having. It was a really cool scene. Very well done. Um, some of the signs in it was bad. One guy goes out of the ship in a spacesuit and burns up instantly. That wouldn't really happen. And, you know, this, that, and the other thing. Um, but that, that part of the science, I don't know. I'm willing, to, I'm willing to accept that we can build a Q-bomb or whatever it was called, the size of Manhattan that we drop into the sun and it kickstarts the sun. The problem is, even if you could get it into the sun, the sun is very, very big. From, you know, the radius of the sun is 700,000 kilometers, 40,000, uh, 400,000 miles. So that's, that's twice the distance to the moon. How would you get something from there to the core of the sun? It would burn up. And even if it didn't burn up, it would take forever to fall in. Um, but again, you, know, you just kind of go, eh, it's a movie. It's OK. It's, it's, it's important to the story, so we'll do it. So I think that's, I think that's pretty cool. OK, you know what? It's 7.15. So stop voting, please, folks. Pencils down. And let's see what happens if I do control F plus three. Nothing because I typed plus pound. Um, Tree Lobsters, you have four upvotes for having something from the very beginning. So we do have a five. Hang on, six. Oh, there's no plus six. Nothing has gotten six votes. Try seven, eight. Ooh, here's one with eight. Okay, we got one with eight. Nothing with nine. 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 18, 20. Nothing with 20. Oh, it looks like plus 8 may be our winner. Um, let me just scan really quickly and make sure nothing ran away with like a gazillion votes. Yeah, it looks like we have a wiener. The winner is... Charles Wagoner, named after Wegener, who discovered continental drift. No, probably not. Um, who was asking about uh, the gravity inside of a Dyson sphere. People like that. So uh, you win. Yay! Uh, so Charles, um, tell you what. Send me uh, a message on Google+, or send me a, an email. Um, and we'll figure out some way of confirming that you are really you. And you'll win a gift certificate to Think Geek for the amazing total of one billion dollars or something several orders of magnitude smaller. Um, I actually don't know how much the gift certificate is. Um, and I don't see anything on Twitter about that. But uh, there you go. So congrats, Charles. That was a good question. I'm glad I answered it, and I'm glad you asked it, and I'm glad you win uh, the big prize, the big cash prize. And I've lost, I've lost my window. Here it is. Okay. Um, terrific. Okay, well, um, I think that's it. Uh, Thank you, everybody who came into this and listened to me blather on. These were really good questions. It's a lot of fun. I should do more themed Q and BAs. Now, I, for those of you who came in because of .con, I tend to do these every Sunday, usually uh, at 11 o'clock Mountain Time, which is 1 o'clock Eastern Time, which is 8 o'clock p.m. Universal Time Coordinated, although that'll change soon when we go back to um, uh, Daylight Saving Time in April, I think. Uh, but I do these uh, for about an hour on Google Plus on the weekends. I, I'm going to be traveling a lot this summer, so I'll be mixing that up. But I love doing stuff like this. I love taking people's questions. Um, usually, um, I will try to edit out little five or six minute snippets. I don't think I'll be able to do that this time because of the, the way I set this up. Um, but again, uh, thank you everybody for showing up and for sending your tweets. Um, you can. I, I'm on Google+. Plus. I'm on Twitter, at BadAstronomer. My website, BadAstronomy.com. If you go there, it'll send you to my blog with Discover Magazine called Bad Astronomy Blog. Uh, Facebook is just my Twitter feed. I don't do anything else on Facebook. I just, oh, I just started on Pinterest. Uh, I, I'm finding Pinterest interesting. The controversy over copyright and everything is I find, I find to be very funny. Um, I'm not using it that much, but I'm just playing with it right now. 
uh, so I'm on Pinterest. If you search, if you go to pinterest.com slash philplate, you'll find me. And uh, also, <coughs> pardon, pardon me, um, I, I've started a company where we are doing science vacations. We're taking vacation packages and adding scientists to them. So uh, our first one is in September of this year, uh, and uh, it's a dude ranch in the mountains of Colorado, about an hour from, uh, from Boulder here, hour and a half. Uh, it's a wonderful dude ranch, and it's the whole dude ranch package where you can go horseback riding and swimming and fishing and whatever, hiking. It's really, really nice, but we're also bringing in a geologist and a biologist and me, and we're going to do nature hikes and stargazing and all that stuff, and if you do it through us, it's actually cheaper than going to the dude ranch on your own. Um, it's the, the, the site is called sciencegetaways.com, science getaways, vacation for your brain. You can search on that. Vacation with your brain. That's our, our motto. If you go to my blog, you'll see a brain with wings. That's our, our, our logo. Click on that. It'll take you there. It's in, the, it's in my sidebar. So I want to put a plug out for that. Um, and finally, I want to thank DotCon. Um, this was uh, the first time we've ever done this, and it was a lot of fun. I, I, think, I think the idea of having an online convention is a good one. I think there's a lot of... Um, a lot of uh, perspective things that can be done here. We did this, we kind of threw this together relatively rapidly, but it seems to have worked. And there's a lot more we can do. And we, we got uh, the Hollywood especially, I think that was my favorite thing. Uh, Josh Kagan, who was a screenwriter, had a, a, a panel with like 20 people, including Stephanie Thorpe and Derek Hughes, my, a couple of pals of mine, Aaron Douglas, who was chief right in Battlestar Galactica, Tara Platt, a bunch of other folks, just talking about Hollywood and geeks and the online community and the future of all that kind of stuff was they really hit home a lot of topics I thought were fa fascinating. So thank you to Dotcon and Chris Wright and and, and Lo uh, Logan Bonner, everybody else who participated, and um, you know I hope we can do this again next year because this was this was awesome. Uh, and that's it. Thank you all and take care. <laughs>